Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening. Hello, wherever you may be calling in from in the world. My name is Brian Howard, and I am a specialist on the Explorer Programs team at the National Geographic Society. And thank you for coming to today's Closer Look. Um, Together with my manager, Stacey McLean, we centralize and strategically manage the surfacing of our explorers on National Geographic platforms and on external stages as well. So we are counterparts with Chad Sandis and the rest of the talent folks over at NGP, if you've ever worked with them. Uh, if this is your first time joining us for a closer look, welcome. We're thrilled to have you here today. If you come to these regularly, welcome back. We're really excited that you're continuing to support our explorers. The goal of this series is to foster a greater understanding of the incredible breadth of people and projects in which the society is invested, and also to create connections between explorers and staff, which will lead to further opportunities to amplify their voices and accelerate the impact of their work. Uh, it's already gotten a lot of really stuff happening, lots of cool stuff moving, so keep it up, keep reaching out to us to work with explorers. Um, I just wanted to reiterate a few things verbally. First, this is being recorded and that includes the public chat function. Uh, on that note, if you have to duck out early or you have team members who you wanna make sure can check out this presentation as well, just let me know and we can share that link with you. Those are all live on NG Connect. Um, also, we do have the live transcript function. So if you'd like to watch subtitles, you can toggle those on and off on the bottom bar with the live transcript button. Uh, so we're so excited today to welcome Explorer and Arbornaut Meg Lauman, who's going to present for about 25 minutes, 25, 30 minutes, and then we'll have a Q&A session. We ask that you hold your questions until the end, uh, and then if you do have a question, you raise your hand, use the hand raise function, and then when you're called on, turn on your camera, turn on your mic, and ask your question yourself. Uh, if your internet's not working, or you can't do that, feel free to type it in the chat and we'll get to it as well. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to Meg's program officer, Luisa Arnedo. Luisa, take it away. Thank you, Brian. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, as Brian said, my name is uh, Luisa Arnedo. For those of you that don't know me, I'm in the science and innovation uh, team, and I oversee projects focused on research and conservation of species. And I'm super excited to introduce our Closer Look speaker today, Meg Lohman, uh, which is better known in the scientific world as Canopy Meg. Um, Meg has spent the last three decades doing research in forest canopies, and she's a pioneer on the field of three top science. Um, some of you know that I am a primatologist by training, so I used to study monkeys, and I saw one that uh, used to do all her research from the ground, but was studying animals that live in the canopy. I cannot tell you how important and influential the work that Meg does is for all of us. Uh, she really brought us a view of that world up there in the three tops that is so amazing and so different to everybody else, to everything else. Um, today, Meg will share part of her work and she will introduce her new memoir, which came out in uh, early August, The Arbonaut. And she will tell us about her new initiative, uh, Mission Green. Uh, welcome, Meg. We are very excited to have you today and uh, take it away. Oh, thank you, Louisa. Thank you, Brian. And give a big shout out for all of you at National Geographic because you have funded me all over the world from Colombia to Ethiopia to all kinds of crazy ways to climb trees. So I'm very, very grateful and I hope I can give back in many ways. Um, Everything look okay, Brian, you'll tell me if there's a problem with the screen, but I think we're on board. Uh, so this is actually the title of my new book that just came out with Farrar, Strauss and Giroux. And I think the most important thing is that the, all the publishers were fascinated by this word Arbornaut. And I think, well, we have astronauts. And when you think about it, in the 1960s, we went to the moon. We have aquanauts in the 1950s, scuba gear was invented. But it wasn't until the 1980s that a handful of us actually turned treetop exploration into a science and developed the methods to go up a tree and hence the word arbornaut, which is similar in its root to those words astronaut and aquanaut. But there still are only a handful of arbornauts and unfortunately only a handful of funding, despite the fact that it's a really, really important part of the planet. So I hope I can convince you a little more about trees today and the importance 
importance of why we need to save them. Uh, in my book, as well as I guess in my real life, because I do a lot of Zoom talks every week with schools all around the country, uh, I think it's humbling and a little humiliating to admit that I was one of those really ordinary kids. We would call me a geek in today's language, but I grew up in the 1960s and that word was not in the dictionary. I was the crazy kid that collected snakeskins and rocks and frogs and wildflowers especially, and I pushed them all under my bed in cardboard boxes that my mother couldn't stand because mice came to my room like crazy. But the bottom line was I think a lot of field biologists start their life as collectors. And I hoped in writing about that in my book that I would convince other young people that maybe if they do some crazy things in their childhood that it could lead to a passion and lead to a career. And so here I am so embarrassed to tell you that this is my fifth grade picture, the only one my mother ever took all year because we didn't have all this camera stuff all the time. And it's with my wildflower collection that I entered into the New York State Science Fair about 500 boys and me were in this science fair. They almost all had volcano experiments. Remember those things where you put the uh, beautiful baking powder in and the vinegar and out popped the volcano. And there I was with these brown pressed, really dull looking wildflowers that I was so proud of, but I got a second prize. It was a miracle. I was tongue tied. I was really shy and couldn't wait to rush off the stage. But in my own eyes, I felt like akin maybe to Rachel Carson or some of my little childhood heroes, all of whom were deceased, I hate to say it, because I never knew a woman in science when I was little. But I think doing these kind of things maybe as a kid helped me get a little comfort for my later life. And I went, I guess, from wildflowers to bigger trees. I became infatuated with trees. I made tree forts in my small rural town where I grew up. Um, there wasn't a whole lot else to do, but lo and behold, it turned into a vocation. And I ended up being that crazy person that uh, ended created slingshot use of accessing the canopy and sewed my first harness in Australia as a graduate student and went on to help build the first canopy walkway in Australia and participate in the inflatable uh, expeditions around the world called Brado de Seam, which was pioneered by some French colleagues and ended up even doing parts with canopy cranes and drones and LIDAR and all sorts of cool techniques, but it all started with that childhood, building those little tree forts in a very rural part of upstate New York. So girls and boys both, I am the mother of two wonderful boys. I think that hopefully you can maybe look at the examples of your older explorers and take note that um, whatever you love, you should pursue it. And that's my take home lesson. Um, from my crazy work of welding a slingshot at Sydney University as a graduate student and sewing that harness, um, lo and behold, a handful of us around the world found out in the 1980s that half of the world's land-based biodiversity lives in the treetops. So that was pretty extraordinary. And in some ways, it does form the basis of my memoir called The Arbor Knot, because I made an analogy to myself. I'm thinking, gosh, you know, foresters for almost 100 years were basically looking at the big toe of their patient. You know, if you went to a doctor and he just examined your big toe and said, I think your brain is healthy and your ears are fine and your eyes are fine, you would say, I'm going to switch doctors. And yet here were all these foresters always walking through forests, looking at the tree trunks, probably estimating the board feet and only seeing the top of the tree when they cut it down. It's kind of crazy because of course the birds would fly off and probably all the insects would have got squished. So nobody a hundred years ago recognized the wealth of biodiversity in the tops of trees until a few crazy graduate students started going up there because their advisors told them to do so. And I was one of those. And today we still estimate that some 90% probably of what lives up there has never been classified or identified simply because there still aren't very many arbor knots in the world as compared to perhaps aquanauts, which are much, much more abundant. 
So with all that, I'll give you a little timeline of how this world of canopy science unfolded. Uh, it did start in the late 1970s. There were some contraptions before that. There were a few towers to look at insect vectors for disease. There were some crazy, crazy and dangerous little walkways built uh, by students like the Oxford expeditions in the 40s and 50s, but there was never a real endeavor to use the canopy as a scientific backdrop or develop safe methods until the early 1980s. And uh, lo and behold, I was a graduate student in Australia. I got a full scholarship. I was pretty excited about that because I'd never really been anywhere except my rural upstate New York background. And I didn't even know what a rainforest looked like except to see it in the journal called National Geographic, which I read with relish in our public library and saw all those very cool pictures as a young kid. But lo and behold, I got to Australia. There were no women in the grad school but me, and there were no women or men studying the rainforests of Australia. It was pretty much 95% cut down by the time I got there. So I had this amazing eureka moment about, wow, this is a very important place, and it's a very urgent issue to figure out how to study the whole tree, not just the bottom of the tree. Uh, so lo and behold, um, I continued on my little track and uh, ended up getting very involved in some of the Rainforest National Parks. I ended up helping to design the first canopy walkway up in Queensland, Australia, mainly because I was teaching so many people to climb trees and some people were afraid of climbing trees. So we needed to think about how could we safely take those cautious visitors and volunteers and educators up trees. So the first public canopy walkway was built in Queensland. Soon after, another very cool one was built in Malaysia, but now we have a whole necklace of them around the world, which I'll talk about a little later. Um, I went on, I came back to the States because quite frankly, a lot of Australia did not appreciate women being involved in science. So I pretty much uh, had that scarlet letter on my chest called S for science, which was not what women are supposed to do. And sought my intellectual asylum back in the States as a professor at Williams College, where I became part of a lot of committees around the world to formulate and grow this new science called canopy biology. Uh, I also built the first canopy walkway in North America on the campus of William, Williams College in their research forest, but that one is very limited to the college students themselves. It doesn't have any kind of public component to it. And I also, as I mentioned, got pretty engaged with the inflatable community, which was totally fun. I felt it was akin to being Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz to go in these incredible dirigibles and the canopy raft, which you see here being towed under the balloon and is just about to land on that cardboard tree in Cameroon, Africa. So those were fabulous ways to get to the very top of the tree, not just three quarters of the way up, which is what a rope can do for you because you need a supportive branch, but all the way to the top, which was very, very cool. And of course, I ended up coming down to Florida as the director of a botanical garden where I built the first public canopy walkway. It seemed very important to get the public to appreciate the tops of trees if we're going to have any success with conservation of forests. And that wonderful tiny walkway is out in Mayaka River State Park, the second largest wilderness area in Florida outside of the Everglades. And to this day, it's 20 years old, it's going strong, it attracts a half a million visitors a year, brings in something between 25 and $30 million of industry to the community of Sarasota County. And that indeed has become a model for my new program called Mission Green that I'll mention in a little bit. But it's amazing that a canopy walkway can compete with Disney, become an absolute attraction for families and kids and educate kids as well as give them a real thrill to engage in their forests and their outdoor activities, which is really fun. To do that, I started a foundation because we needed a vehicle for donations. And the Tree Foundation's mission is tree research, education, and exploration, T-R-E-E, -E, very simple. And through this, we now fund walkways around the world. We fund science books for girls and 
uh, developing countries which have forests that are endangered. We fund grad students. We just are a very, very minuscule National Geographic in terms of trying to focus on saving big trees. That's mostly our mission through things like canopy walkways and education programs. And to that end, I guess in my dotage now that I have had, Louisa, I hate to tell you, 40 years in the canopy, not just 30. Um, I just published this memoir, memoir that came out at the end of August with Farrar Strauss and Giroux that talks a lot about all of my misadventures as well as adventures in developing the toolkit and publishing a lot of the textbooks and going to at last count 46 countries to study their canopies and hopefully still going strong when COVID is over because a lot of forests of the world really need our help, not just tomorrow, but yesterday. So that's a big challenge for me and any other arbor knots in the world. So we're all really, really concerned about the loss of our forests, which has been so extreme in the last couple of years in particular. So what about these trees and why are they important? And I hope in my book, I make a good public explanation, not for scientists alone, but why is it that trees are so important? And first of all, they provide us with extraordinary services. And I walk through a couple of case studies in the book because I've worked a lot in India and Bhutan and other countries where the Amazon, of course, uh, places where trees are worth zillions of dollars. But I've also lectured at a lot of business schools and MBA programs, and most students have no clue that a tree is worth anything except some, some kind of thing that litters leaves in their backyard if they live in Westchester County outside of New York City or something and work at a big bank in New York. So it's been a real education for me as well as for my clients to recognize that we need to educate the broader public about the value of trees. And so I go around giving people what I call cocktail party um, assignments where you need to talk about the 10 cool things that trees do for you before you've had two drinks, because a lot of these folks, of course, do all of their business that way, and um, scientists usually don't. But as you all know, because of your jobs, probably I'm reviewing this, but trees cleanse fresh water through their foliage, which is fabulous. They produce oxygen with those millions of leaves in the canopy. They provide us with sustainable timber and food and clothing if we're careful about managing our forests. Things like chocolate and oranges and cherries. Oh my gosh, the list goes on and on about what different tall trees provide for us. Um, their roots, of course, conserve the soil and prevent flooding when there are heavy rains. We all know that when trees are cut down, cities get much more flooded and neighborhoods are more prone to having all sorts of problems with their water flow. So that's a pretty much a given. Um, because of our whole tree exploration, we know that trees house 50% of species on the planet. And because of our whole tree exploration, we understand a lot more about the carbon storage all the way up the tree, not just at the bottom. And we understand much more about how forests really do control our climate, which is so critical to the future of our children and grandchildren. One thing I've had trouble putting a dollar sign on, but I've written a couple of publications on this recently is, how important trees are to religion. And there's over 2 billion people in the world that rely on trees as a spiritual heritage. So this is a puzzle to me. I welcome your ideas. How do you put a dollar sign on the spiritual value of a forest? But it's really, really important to so many people. And I'm glad that it's coming out into the open. Part of that, thanks to National Geographic, who's been funding me in Ethiopia, where trees are very much a critical element of the religious history and heritage. Other things that I really focus on in the book are near and dear to my heart. I think it's critical that we get kids outside. And when I give talks, maybe you all can even raise your hand right now home in your living room, but how many of you have ever climbed a tree in your life? And usually even big kids raise their hands. I see Brian and Louisa raising your hands because it was part of our childhood and it's very meaningful. And somewhere, somehow it must relate back to our primate ancestry that we all have this kind of synergy with a tree and if we can recreate that for adults, big kids as I call them, and especially the ones that are corporate leaders and 
government leaders, maybe it will turn around the way that we normally treat trees these days. Um, by the way, in this slide, these are third graders using my walkway outside of Sarasota, Florida, here where I live. And in third grade on a field trip, they all discovered an invasive weevil and they published with me. They are now published scientists at the age of 10. So it shows you, I hate to say it, but maybe you don't need a PhD to be a scientist. Um, and these wonderful girls here are part of the Meg Lauman Treetops Camp. Uh, my hometown is very un economically underprivileged. So I do a summer camp every year where we take the girls at the bottom of the heap and teach them to climb trees and go fishing and a few other things in nature in hopes that they might turn their lives around or feel like I might have done that someday they can do whatever they wish. So that's been a, lot, a great privilege to mentor some of these girls. Um, so moving on, the book again talks about the value of trees, it talks about getting kids into nature, but I try to weave it through my own story and my own eyes with some of the countries that I've worked in and visited, and I have about five chapters in the book that visit these countries, and each one has a different mission and purpose of why the trees are important and why we need to save them. But one of my favorites is Ethiopia. Uh, thank you very much. National Geographic has funded insect research there with my teams and herpetological research. And we hope to move on and do plants and birds in the near future. But the amazing thing about Ethiopia is here are the remaining trees in these little circles that we call church forests, where the church is located in the center and the trees are part and parcel of the church property. So all the rest of Northern Ethiopia where this is taken is subsistence agriculture. They don't have irrigation. They don't have tractors. They don't even have metal tools. Somehow a lot of the NGOs that are helping farmers just hasn't reached Ethiopia. And so they need to clear a lot to feed their families, but they all respect the fact that the priests believe that they should look after all of God's creatures as part of the church mission. And I, as a conservation biologist, believe I should look after uh, biodiversity. So somehow, some way, I have become part of the religious sect in Ethiopia. We have a wonderful local on the ground trust in relationship, which I call bottom-up conservation, meaning that it just comes from the community up rather than pouring money into the government and hoping that it trickles down to the bottom. Here's the Google Earth image of Northern Ethiopia. This is what you just saw up a little closer, but you can see the tragic landscape here where none of those priests in that picture know what the surrounding landscape is like because they don't have computers or cell phones and they've never had a biology class and even the kids in the local school over here don't have a library or any textbooks or computers to share with them that this is what their landscape looks like. So what a shock to find out that the last remaining tidbits of their native biodiversity, including all of their pollinators, are in these little itty bitty sections. Less than 4% of the forest is left. And here's how the landscape looks when you're trying to walk home with some water from one of those very few tracts of forest where the spring water is still flowing. Uh, so here's our partnership. And this is the chief priest of the Gondor region who has somehow adopted me. He's building me a hut on his church property so that I can come over and live near him. But we have created this amazing special friendship that allows me to come and bring groups in and also to have his ear, most importantly, so that we together can work on solutions. And I have to say, nothing is possible in conservation without the trust of local people. It's very embarrassing. A lot of times I see colleagues meaning very well, but going in and acting very colonialist saying we must do this and we must do that. But I've spent many hundreds of hours praying with this guy. You have to build the relationship by doing the things that they do and not maybe doing the scientific things that you would wish you could do. So we have two simple solutions that are working really well. 
One is, of course, to educate all the priests. So I and my local colleague travel around and give workshops to the priests, sharing with a generator our pictures of these Google Earth images that gives them a sense of the urgency of conservation for them. And then at their own volition, the priests invented this solution, which was we can take stones out of the local farms, which the farmers love, and their fields are better for farming when we do that. And we can build these walls and keep the cattle and sheep out from grazing on the saplings, build a little farther from the edge of the trees so they have some room for expansion and most of all create this wonderful conservation wall that allows them to know their trees are safe from any kind of outside influence. Um, and we've done these biodiversity surveys, which the priests always marvel. They go, well, we don't really need a checklist. We need to have our forest saved. But the good news is by having these checklists, thanks to National Geographic, we're able to fundraise and explain to people the importance of what lives in there and how absolutely critical it is to also share it with the local kids, which is another education opportunity. Here are some of my helpers sporting this t-shirt that I kind of invented, which was, you know, we can't give them a field guide. We can't even give them a checklist on paper because they don't have a library. The paper would end up in their mom's cook stove or fireplace. And so we made t-shirts as the field guide on their backs where we have in Amaric, all of the important pollinators, and hopefully the kids love to wear the t-shirts and that way they have some meaningful keepsake that helps educate them about the local pollinators. Uh, but every community has different ways that we need to educate the people. There is no one model like in the US where you can hand out a CD or give them a computer program and they all go to work and have iNaturalist and do whatever they wanna do. In so many of these places, they need really different toolkits to get the messages across. And I think that's the real value of bottom-up conservation and the value of having every scientist work in places where they're very familiar and perhaps they've worked for a long time to get that level of trust. Um, so for me, um, it's a point of pride. This is the rain, uh, church forest called Zada, which is outside of Bahir Dar. It's one of 20 that we've walled. We have 40 on our list, so we're halfway there. We've raised about $500,000 to wall 20 forests, and we need about 500,000 more to wall 20 more. It's not a lot compared to a NASA budget, but it's a whole lot in Ethiopian dollars. So we're just working away to make that happen, hopefully in the next few years as these forests continue to degrade. Um, so that case study about Ethiopia is not unlike things happening in many other parts of the world. And I think the last year or two have really seen extraordinary deforestation episodes. We've lost uh, forests in the Amazon to a number of things, including fire. We've lost extraordinary amounts of trees in Australia due to fire and in Siberia, even in California, in Eastern Europe, there's just been an amazing almost assault on our global forests. And so it's the time and the place, um, it's almost too late, but that we need to galvanize activities. And for me, who is a forest scientist, I think about what is my legacy? What should my career be? And I sure hope it's not 150 publications in a journal and 10 graduate students and maybe some knowledge of naming a dozen or so species, but I think I really need to work harder to use my skill set to save forests first and foremost. So thanks to a friend of mine named Sylvia Earle that I'll talk about in a minute, I founded a new project called Mission Green, which is hopefully going to identify the most important hotspots of forest in the world and globally promote them through economics and conservation and education. Um, working with scientists, working with the indigenous people that live there, working with students and hopefully philanthropy that is needed to fund this program. Um, so I do give a big tribute to my dear and old friend, Sylvia Earle, who's had her mission blue for the last 10 years, which she founded to identify hope spots in the ocean. And since she started in 2010, she now has 
over a hundred of these spots where she advocates to the world and to the local communities, you need to save these important places. And it's been a really successful opportunity. So on Earth Day, she and I uh, co-wrote an op-ed in the Miami Herald to launch Mission Green, which is the land version of Sylvia's Mission Blue. And I'm really grateful to all of Sylvia's mentoring over the years because I guess I represent the next generation for her. And even though she's very spry in her amazing age, she still is kicking and screaming and doing great things for the oceans, which is absolutely fantastic. So I hope I will do the same as she has for the next 25 years until I get to become her age. Um, my emeritus chair, I'm really honored to say is Ed Wilson. He's been my other secret weapon in this Mission Green launch. But Ed wrote a book a couple of years ago called Half Earth. I was one of his 10 advisor scientists where he wrote to a handful of us and said, what are the most important places for biodiversity that we need to save? And he printed those in the book. And about 10 of those 20 sites are forests. And so I have extracted as list uh, with his permission, of course, to say, you know what, we don't want to save 50% of the world's forests, we don't want to save just any forest, we want to save only those forests that have the highest biodiversity, making them genetic libraries of a sort. Um, so using that list and my scientific expert advisory board, we're now able to launch Mission Green in the next few months. We're just finishing the website right now so that we can have experts like um, Pat Wright for our walkway in Madagascar, and of course, Peter Raven and his wife, Pat, for advice on a number of different countries. Uh, Wade Davis will be helping us with some of the Pacific Northwest activities, but the bottom line is that we need to get these experts, we need to implement these walkways quickly. And the good news is that together we can build these walkways, we can turn them into ecotourist operations given jobs to the local people as bird guides, as cooks, as the runners of ecotourist lodges, as the boat drivers, any number of opportunities turn into sustainable income, which is a lot more lasting and valuable than just getting that short-term cash from logging the forests. Uh, I've just hired our first director of education, which I'm excited about. University of Florida is going to fund a Peruvian student that they've had who is somebody that I mentored since fifth grade. She was part of the Jason project when Bob Ballard and I did the Amazon for our um, canopy year in 1999. And Pamela was my fifth grade mentee and she's now finishing her PhD and moving back to the Amazon to develop education units for our walkways and work with the indigenous people down there to train them to be guides on the walkway that we've already built in Peru. So all of these 10 walkways will have this kind of triage of having the walkway built by our funds, having the local people operate them with outside collaborations, and then hopefully and eventually having student research come in, both local students and international students to start uncovering all the biodiversity that lives there. So we have this desperate situation, I call it triage in a hospital emergency room where we have to really save the most important forest. We have to maybe prioritize for a change and not just plant trees, in our backyards, even though that's great, and not just say we want to regenerate something that's ordinary and common, but really, really focus on saving these extraordinary places that are about to disappear. So that's what my mission green is all about. It's the last chapter of the book. I was very determined to make sure my book had an element of hope at the end of it. I want kids and students to read the book and not get depressed, even though there's so much damage happening to our forests. I think it's really important that um, young people look at models and opportunities where they could get involved and do good things. So with that, I think I've probably talked enough and I'm really happy to have had your eyes and ears for a few minutes and I'd be so happy to answer questions. So. Back to you, Madam Louisa. Thank you so much. Thank you, Meg. What an amazing journey uh, you took us through. And uh, thank you so much for sharing your experience, your history, uh, your amazing research uh, with us. 
Uh, I will encourage everybody who has a question to raise your hand, turn on your camera and ask a question. So if you want to raise your hand, I will call you. Um, and I, I actually will start uh, with a question. Um, you know, you talk about how difficult it was for you to begin in, at the beginning to be a researcher, uh, to be a scientist, you know, obviously uh, it was 40 years ago, you left Australia because of, it was so hostile apparently. Um, and, and research is still like, you know, it's a hard place for women. It's still a hard place for women uh, and science in general. Uh, but you have done so much mentoring with young girls. And I was wondering what it would be your advice for girls that are interested in the STEM and to stick on it and, and move forward with, with that career path. Yeah, oh, thanks for asking that. I did devote a whole chapter in the book. I call it the glass canopy instead of the glass ceiling, which is what they call it in the corporate world. Um, because I did spend probably an inordinate amount of time trying to get out of difficult situations or working in places where I wasn't really welcome. And my hope is to give girls good advice. So I start that chapter out by saying there's two things. If you're a woman and wanting to do science, you need to not be afraid of being smart and bold because I was always afraid of ending up looking smart because the guys would resent that. And my second advice was that women need to support other women because I think there's a little element sometimes of uh, too much you know, competitive or maybe behavior that's not supportive. But if you can all support each other, we can help women a lot. I watched all the guys go off to the pub or play golf or do something after work while I would go home and do laundry and make dinner and help with the homework. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, you know, women, maybe we could have worked together and averted that type of lifestyle if we'd been smarter at the time. So I did write a book about the canopy 20 years ago for the public, and I was way too scared to even mention all of the different types of hurdles that I overcame because I was a woman in field biology. And this time I kind of let it out because I think the Me Too has allowed us to be, have a freer voice. So for better, or for worse, I just think, um, and I suppose because I don't have to be fired by a male boss anymore <laughs> that I could write about this and get away with it. But I hope that it's useful and you know it's not intended to be negative. It's just intended to be meaningful because it still is out there. And I still take plenty of expeditions where I look around and there aren't too many young women and there definitely aren't too many older women either. So I think we need to encourage that. And I have spent a lot of my time mentoring girls and even you know working with kids in wheelchairs, which is one of my chapters because there's a lot of underprivileged folks, I think, for field biology, where people imply, well, you're not entitled to do that, you're not fit to do that, you're not capable of doing that, and I think we need to be in more inclusive if we can. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Catherine. Great, thanks, Louisa. Thanks, Brian, and thank you, Meg, so much. It was such a wonderful talk. I really- hey, uh, thank you, Catherine. Sure, hi. Nice um, to see you. Really nice <laughs> to see oh you. Oh my gosh. Um, I'm letting oh everybody my. know that as soon as I finish it, I'll bring it to the office and we can pass it around um, <laughs> or buy your own copy. Maybe that's better. But um, I wondered, Meg, if you could give some advice. Um, I know the last chapter of your book talks about what people can do. Um, but if you were advising an organization, any organization, National Geographic included, on what they could do um, at this moment in time, for forests um, and recognizing that you were involved in our species discovery work. So this could be anything from like specific areas of research to lean into, conservation efforts, um, innovative um, philanthropic uh, measures, education, citizen science, or a combination of all of that. Um, where would you tell an international organization, a national organization, or even National Geographic where time right now and energy is best spent to help um, trees? Right, great question. And you know, I just did this thing called Reddit an hour before I got on the air with all of you. It's some new young person's question chat thing where they have 4 million visitors. Jane Goodall told me I have to do that. At age 87, I had lunch with her last week in London, and she's like, you have to get on Reddit because you can talk to the young people. But they all were asking me, should we plant trees? Should we plant trees? And so my advice is we need to save big trees. 
I am a real fan of anybody planting trees and schoolyards can plant trees. It's a great exercise for kids to learn about seeds and germination and cotyledons, but we have really overlooked saving big trees. And we've allowed people to say, you can cut that tree down to expand your garage if you plant 10 trees and it's really not the same. And in Australia right now, my old homeland where we even lost our farm to the fires, everybody said, well, we'll plant new eucalypts. The koalas will be saved. Well, those eucalypts won't support koalas for a hundred years. Their canopies of little seedlings and saplings will take decades to be of the strength and the structure and the biodiversity to support the populations of koalas that are in these Red Cross centers being you know, rehabilitated. So it's kind of crazy, I think, that we've allowed ourselves to just allow big trees to slip out of the picture. So I think everywhere we can look around, starting in our local communities, reward people to save big trees, reward communities that say there's a mall being constructed, make a courtyard if you have a gorgeous live oak in the middle, don't cut it down because that's really the home to the biodiversity and the seedlings aren't. So creating as many programs as we can that encourage that. I just started again, I'm very grassroots with my little tree foundation, but we're giving t-shirts to Tanzanians who save a baobab tree in their farm because they're so tempted to cut it down. They don't think they need it. Maybe they need it for fruits once a year, but now they're going to have this very cool t-shirt that they're really excited to broadcast. Um, you know, so just small things where how can we educate everybody about the value of big trees. And I think, you know, saving primary forests is important. We've lost so many, including in the US. So focusing maybe some grants on areas where people are trying to save primary forests and not just finding the biodiversity, but developing programs that help people conserve those forests would be really, really key. And I think you have the experts in your cadre that would help you find those places and identify them. It's almost like burning the Louvre and then saying, oh, well, we're gonna start 10 little tiny galleries outside of Paris. You know, we're just losing so much in addition to the trees every time we cut the big trees down. So creative, innovative ways to save big trees would be my advice. Thank you. Uh, Greg. Unmute myself. Mm -hmm. Hey, Meg, how are you? Oh my gosh, I'm happy to see you, darling. <laughs> Meg is one of my favorite people and I, you know, it's this weird story. I had worked with Mac when we were doing the Jason project, but about four years ago, I think it was, I was in uh, Goring Gulf in Mozambique <laughs> for a science selling boot camp, and we're traveling around this property and kept running into this woman. See this woman. It's like, I know who she is, but who is it? You know, you get to a certain age and you kind of lose track of that. And someone said, that's Meg Loman. So Meg and I had the pleasure of sitting at dinner one night and you were at Goring Gulfa because you were working on some kind of uh, tourism aspect, uh, uh, hotels, dwellings in the treetop canopy at Goring Gulfa National Park. Where is that? Is that oh, still happening? I'm so glad you asked. That's amazing because that is one of our 10 hotspots for endangered forests. And so I was there as a prelude to Mission Green being launched to talk to Greg Carr, if I may say his name, because he has been the best, best funder for Ed Wilson's Gorongosa Lab and Ecotour. So he basically shook my hand at that meeting and said, I will fund your walkway. We'll help you educate the girls to be guides, the local school girls and families. So the only reason that is on hold is because remember they had the big storm and it came in and they had to redirect a lot of their construction efforts to other things beside building canopy walkways. But I very much hope next year we can pick up where we left off in Mozambique because that's a fabulous site for a walkway and incredibly deserving biodiversity in an area where again, the big trees aren't always appreciated as much as they need to be. So hopefully you'll come back there with me. You were teaching people how to communicate science as I recall. So we probably need you. And, and, and I hold you up as an expert. In <laughs> Another question. Uh, you talk about your beginnings as a, a naturalist and, and you know being the only woman in upstate New York and getting out and into the world. Uh, and, and you shared with me once this West Virginia story that was crucial to your getting out. But what was it that was in you 
that made you persevere against all of these odds? You know, I try to think hard about that, but I think I was so shy and so geeky, truly. I didn't have the kind of, I wasn't interested in makeup or manicures like all my girlfriends were in elementary school. I really wanted to go bird watching and I wanted to identify the darn wildflowers. So something innate within me gave me that love for nature. And I think a lot of that was playing outside, which is why I always encourage parents to do that. Even if you have to look at a sidewalk crack or go and look at the birds in a tiny park in New York, you know, there's just that ability to maybe relate to them. And especially if you have a quirk, which I, is my you know term for saying that I was maybe not a normal kid. I was not that outgoing or beautiful or popular, but I just loved nature and that helped me a lot. But it also now as an adult gives me a lot of empathy for helping kids who might not be in the mainstream. You know, I worked with Temple Grandin to create these dark mornings at our museum in Raleigh for the kids that have autism. I mean, there's just so many kids that might feel like they're not mainstream and maybe nature can appeal to them, which I think is really important for all of us to foster. Yeah, and Meg, you know, in case people don't know who Temple Grandin is, yeah. can you talk about her? Sure, so she's, a, I think, a wonderful person, and I'm so proud she actually did an endorsement of my book, but she herself had some issues with autism and is a voice for autism, but she's also a big voice for animal rights and you know um, her work with horses and other kinds of farm animals has been quite extraordinary and she's authored some best-selling books about that topic as well so just again an unusual lady with an unusual childhood <laughs> i can't wait to read your book thank oh, you oh thank you i can't wait to get your comments say what <laughs> she did what she ate bugs she i did do a lot of terrible things in my youth that my mother's embarrassed to read <laughs> Because I was on such a budget. <laughs> yeah. okay. Wonderful. Thank you, Greg. Um, Jill. Yeah. Hi, Meg. Wonderful talk. Good to oh, see you again. You, Jill. you too. Hi there. <laughs> and congratulations on your recent book. Oh, um, I have a question um, about your Forest Green initiative. And I guess I'm curious if you've reached this stage yet, um, how many of the uh, critical important forest areas that have been identified overlap with biodiversity hotspots? Is it, um, is that pretty much on par with what you would expect? And then um, how are you planning on moving forward with conservation of some of these spaces? Right, great, great question. And absolutely, yes, they do overlap with biodiversity. And by adopting Ed Wilson's list and not taking years to create our own most of those people that he you know, asked about to create his list, and he, he lists the 15 people in the back of the book, are those folks that have been working on forests and biodiversity for years. So in some sense, there's a synergy there with these big forests, these, a lot of them tropical, but not all. I mean, Redwoods was one of them and so on and so forth. So they do overlap with biodiversity. And so that becomes really, really important that we need to save both. The big trees seem to be, you know, paralleling this whole business of hosting the biodiversity, which is important. Um, how will we move forward is obviously a huge question. COVID has been totally impairing us, but the good news is, I guess what I've done with Mission Green is said, how can I use my skills to save forests? And a lot of that is knowing the whole canopy community. So for example, three years ago, I helped a group in Malaysia build a fabulous canopy walkway, one corporate sponsor, one check. I had to do all the science. Just this week, we got a UNESCO World Heritage Biological uh, site approved for this place. So, you know, so some of these sites have, are in the making and are further along. That one's paid for. They have 30 people employed that are local. They need the canopy education material. They don't have experts, but they've paid for this gorgeous walkway. And now they do have conservation in perpetuity, which was fostered by our going there. And I led a big bio blitz for them two years ago with a hundred scientists and so on and so forth. Other places like Madagascar have the aegis of a national park 
where Pat Wright and others have been doing research for many decades. So I'm relying again on the local people to advise us. What is the best way to employ people if we build this walkway and ensure the site will have conservation value? As you all know more than anyone in the world, you know, we can all do something wonderful and walk away. And at the end of the day, it is the locals that are the stewards. No matter what we say, you could say, this is a national park or this thing is a wall around it or whatever, but it's their behavior and ethic and education level that determine the success. So my hope is again, using that bottom up value system where we can't work anywhere without having really good local input um, and then creating we need to then market the ecotourism i need to come to you and say would national geographic like to lead trips to the canopy walkways of the world that are housing 50 percent of biodiversity maybe people can get a passport for seeing you know the coolest forests in the world instead of all the disney properties oops sorry disney because <laughs> i love your partnership but um you know i just think we need to think of ways to market the opportunity for people to visit these cool aerial trails and then support the ecotourism because a lot of the future conservation will lie, I think, in providing economics to the local people, which has been the big, I think, problem up to date. You can't put a glass dome over a rainforest and tell the people not to use it that live there. You can't tell them not to grow anything there. You've got to figure out how to get them some income. So this is really a blend of economics and conservation together, I hope. that's our. It's a big test, but we're hoping to see the results because we've had successes elsewhere. I did a paper for Biotropica looking at three walkways and the economic value they offered to the uh, public and you know they were all very positive so we just have to implement that model better in the future. Yeah thanks for that and it sounds like we have some new entries on the bucket list right? <laughs> I hope. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah thank you. I will definitely would love to have that password. <laughs> Uh, before going to Catherine, just one, one question that you actually, actually I, I asked you if, if there was any questions that you wanted me to ask you, which is a fun one, that is, uh, which one is your favorite food to eat when you're in the canopy? I do, you know, I do all these lectures for school kids because there's two children's books that have been written about me, which is kind of wild and crazy, but the teachers have one of the books is in the curriculum for about 30 states in fifth grade. So they all write and all the kids, of course, get up on the Zoom and Dr. Lauman, what do you eat in the canopy? So I always find that kind of amusing, but I do write in all of my books about surviving on Oreo cookies and the fact that they are just so wonderful to share sometimes. I know you shouldn't give sweet things to kids that don't have toothbrushes, but sometimes they come in so handy because a little water and a little chocolate goes a long way when you're dehydrated and really tired in the canopy. So that has to be my favorite. But I will put a plug in for entomophagy. I'm a real bug eater. And when you go somewhere, you eat what they have. And I've tasted a lot of wonderful bugs in my life and they ain't bad. They're really fun. I know they're not. I, I used to do that too. And they're, they're usually surprisingly better than you think they're going to be. <laughs> uh, thank you. Catherine, go ahead. Thanks, Louisa. Um, this is uh, not such an uplifting question, but um, it's been on my mind uh, because I've we funded your work with the Ethiopian Church for us for so long. Um, and I love that project. And you just mentioned local collaborators. So I wondered, I don't know the geography of Ethiopia well enough to know um, if any of your collaborations, collaborators are, have been affected by um, the, the ongoing trouble in Tigray. Um, yeah, oh, thanks so much for asking. Cause yeah, I keep track of that every single minute. Um, it hasn't, the good news is it has not. The Tigray area is way in the Northeast corner. Um, and even though it looks close on the map, it obviously isn't. As you know, the roads are difficult and nobody even owns a car to begin with. Most of my colleagues and most of my work has been in the northern half of Ethiopia, but more central. And uh, my colleagues there are part of a group called ORDA, which is the Organization for Degradation and Restoration of the Agricultural Areas, which does include forests. The biggest issue has been COVID. A lot of them have been near death with COVID, um, and it's been scary because they don't have any of the opportunities for medical care that we do, but they're coming out of that, and so there's a lot of hope that we can get back on track. Um, the, the good news is that the farmers haven't been clearing more. There hasn't been a lot of kind of 
extreme deforestation during these times. People have been hunkered down. So I'm really just chomping at the bit to get back there. It was the last place I was when COVID hit and closed everything down and hopefully will be the first place I get back to. But um, it's very sad what's happening in the Northeast corner. And of course it kind of you know streams over the borders of the country and it hasn't been good globally. But it's a little bit like saying, oh my gosh, you know, COVID is terrible in Florida. And people that look at that from England say, well, I better not travel to Ohio because I might catch it. You know, fortunately it's not really immediate in that sense. Thank you. Um, and thanks for supporting everything, Catherine, because <laughs> it has been one of the best things going. And I mean, it's just for a little amount of money, we've done so much there. That's what really inspires me a lot. Thanks. So um, I just, I, I think I have one more question. Um, you know, when you talk about, you know, the last two years, obviously with the, with the fires have been really hard, you know, for all of us that care about conservation, watching this has been so discouraging. Um, but I, you know, what do you have hope for? I guess that the question is that do you have hope for the future and how you hold on that? And, uh, you know, you talk about that, you know, protecting those big trees. Um, but what else can we do to, you know, to save all this wonderful biodiversity? Oh, as a mom, I have hope because obviously I can't say anything different when I talk to kids. I think it's so absolutely important to be optimistic. As a scientist, I have less hope quietly because I do think that we're getting close to a tipping point by reducing those numbers of big trees. The scary thing is we don't know how much habitat water bears need or rosellas need. I mean, we know a few species and we've studied some species well and some species not at all, but we don't even really have a sense of how will they restore. If you clear the Amazon, how do they all creep back into this giant restoration area. We predict, but we really don't know and we don't have the data. Um, I was part of some really long-term research restoration projects in Australia because when I was in Australia, they cut down about 95% of their rainforest at the time. And boy, we measured seedlings this tall, about three inches, and they were 60 years old. You know, they weren't going anywhere without the microclimate to be just right and the sun flex to be just right. And, you know, so many factors that we really had no ability to measure. So I worry about that a lot. So what can we do besides save big trees? In America, I, we just have to change consumerism. And I don't know how and who wants to put that in their mission because obviously no food company wants to announce that they will no longer use palm oil or soy or you know, beef or other things that might have come from the Amazon or come from Indonesia. We need to know exactly what the ingredients are in every product we buy. And nobody's willing to print that because nobody's requiring them to print that. No governors or governments or policymakers are wanting to tell corporate industries you need to print this. Um, because you know, if you buy soy, if you're vegetarian, you don't want it to come from the Amazon, but it's hard to tell. If you buy lipstick, heaven forbid, you don't want to know that there's palm oil in it, but nobody has that printed in big letters. If you buy this, you are responsible for deforesting Malaysia. You know, it's just a shame that I think Americans buy so much without any history of knowledge. And if we had better labeling and better product control, we could change that. Or if we just required it, if we scream and shout and say, we need to do better. Shade grown coffee is a great example buying local beef, buying local soy, buying timber that's produced locally or nationally so you know the origin of it and not some kind of shyster that's selling you something on sale that they call redwood, but you don't really know what it is. I think there's a lot of times when we're tempted by price and not by um, the ethics of what we're buying. So that would be my hope. And last but not least, of course, educating important people, talking outside of the box, like not talking for me just to scientists, but going to rotary clubs or religious groups or people that maybe normally don't learn about trees and trying to help them understand is also important. Mm -hmm. well, thank you so much, Meg. Uh, this was wonderful. We're so happy to have you and support you. And, um, you know, Keep doing the work that you're doing. This is really Thank amazing. Thank you all. Well, you all too. Thank you for being out there doing good stuff. Thank you, Keep everybody.
<laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody else, and uh, have a great uh, rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.